Sound check, sound check. AP Chemistry, this is uh, Unit 1, Foundations, Lesson 6, Periodic Trends. So previously, we said that similar charges repel and different charges attract each other. These are referred to as Coulomb forces. And there over on the right, you see that relationship. Positive repels positive and negative repels negative. Those are similar charges. Opposite charges, uh, positive, negative, uh, attract each other. So this is a, an equation that we will pretty much never use in this class, but you should understand the concept because it's the driving force behind everything that happens in chemistry are these positive negative attractions. So what Coulomb's law states is that the electrical force is equal to a constant times on the top the two charges, the charge on each of the two particles divided by the distance between them, the square of the distance between them. So when you look at a, a formula like this, the first thing you just want to kind of understand is what is it solving for? In this case, it's solving for the force between two uh, subatomic particles, in our case, protons and electrons. And what is that a function of? It's a function of how much charge is on the proton and the electron and how far apart they are from each other. So generally speaking, the more charge there is, what this equation is telling us, the more charge there is, uh, the more force there, there will be between them, and um, the distance between them squared is on the, is in the denominator. So the greater the distance becomes, the larger that number becomes, the smaller the force becomes. So two objects that are far apart don't exert much force on each other. That's really the most important thing to understand. So Fe is the force between the two charges. Q1 and Q2 are the magnitude. That means amount. It means the, uh, the number, the magnitude of the charges, how big they are. D is the distance between them. And Coulomb's constant, K, is simply this number that's found through experimentation. So it's 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. Now, when you look at those units of measure, they look kind of intimidating. What does all that mean? What a constant is, is it's really simply a conversion factor. We've talked about conversion factors. It's a bunch of conversion factors all rolled into one number. So that when you plug in the uh, units of measure for Q1 and Q2, which are Coulombs, capital C, and the units for distance, which is in meters on the bottom, that K, those units in the K there, will make all those things cancel out so at the end you only have newtons of force which is the unit of measure for force so all other units should cancel out except the one that you want over on the left side for force and that would be newtons and that's what that constant does it's just a bunch a lot of conversion factors rolled into one number okay we'll talk about that more in the future so almost everything that happens in chemistry is the result of coulomb forces So here's a problem for you to work. You won't be asked to do one of these on the AP, but I'll ask you to do a couple of them in the assignment. Um, because it, first of all, one thing it does is it, pr you, it helps you to practice your scientific notation, uh, multiplications and divisions. So what is the Coulombic attraction between a proton, and there's the charge on a proton, and an electron? And you'll notice the charges are the same value, except one is positive and one is negative. And they're separated by 0.71 nanometers. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and I'll just go ahead and solve that problem. There's the formula. And there are the numbers plugged in. So K is the value 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. Q1 is the positive charge. It doesn't matter which one you put first. And that's the positive 1.602. And Q2 is going to be the electron, the negative charge. That's negative 1.062. And then down on the bottom, remember what you have to do, 0.71 nm. You have to take that n and convert it into a scientific notation um, number, into a, a 10 to the exponent. And we practiced that on one of our earlier assignments. 
So it's going to be 0.71 and the nano turns into 10 to the minus 9 and then it's meters. And then all of that has to be squared. So you're squaring the unit of measure meters. You're also squaring the 0.71. You're also squaring the 10 to the minus 9th. Okay, so you get, get a little math practice on this. You have to be able to work these calculations um, accurately. All right, so how do we do this? Well, first deal with the coefficients. So everything on top gets multiplied and it's divided by everything on the bottom. Now the 8.99 times 10 to the 9th, it, it looks like it's in the middle, but it's considered to be in the numerator. If it's only on one level, it's up in the numerator, okay? So you multiply 8.99 times 1.602 times negative 1.602, and then you divide by 0.71 squared. And when you do all of that, you end up with 45.7686. All right, now we deal with the exponents, with the, 10, the base 10 exponents. So the exponents in the first term, um, 8.99 times 10 to the 9th is 9, and then it's minus 19, and then it's minus 19, and then the one on the bottom is tricky when you square negative 9. So it's 10 raised to the negative 9th and then squared. And one of your principles that's on your sheet of logs and exponents is that when you raise something to a power and then raise that to a power, you multiply the two exponents. So it's negative 2 times 9 gives you negative 18. Now remember what you're doing with an exponent on the bottom is you're subtracting it. So it's going to be minus negative 18 that's going to give you the positive 18 that you see there all right so you got to practice these things a little bit just to avoid those mathematical mistakes that you can make like that so anyway when you add all those numbers up you get 9 minus 19 is negative 10 minus 19 is minus 29 and then you add 18 back you get negative 11. so what you have is 45.7686 we're going to go ahead and round that to the two significant figures Two significant figures because 0.71 in the original problem has two significant figures that limits us. So it's 46 times 10 to the negative 11th and then you have to adjust the decimal. You need to make the 46 smaller to make it a number between 1 and 9.9. .9. So 46 goes to 4.6. You made that number smaller by one position so you need to make the exponent bigger by one position and making negative 11th bigger is going in the positive direction to negative 10. So the final answer there is 4.6 times 10 to the negative 10th. So practice this problem. Just go off and, and do it a second time without looking at this and see if you can get the numbers right, okay? You need, to, you need to clean up math mistakes that you might make on these types of problems as soon as possible. All right. So lithium, we're going to talk about a Z number, which uh, we defined that earlier as being the same as the atomic number. So lithium has an atomic number of three. The atomic number is called the Z number. The atomic number is the number of protons in an element. And remember, it's the number of protons that defines the element. What that means is lithium must have three protons. If, if the atom has a different number than three protons, it's not lithium. If it has three protons, it absolutely is lithium. So that defines the element. So here's a diagram of lithium, the way you drew diagrams in the, pre in the previous lessons. And it has three protons. And then if you round the atomic mass down there, 6.94 to the nearest whole number, that would be seven. So that means the most common isotope of lithium has, uh, a, has a mass number of seven. That's seven total protons plus neutrons. If it has seven protons plus neutrons, and we know that three of them are protons, then the other four have to be neutrons. Also, we know in an, in an, in a, an electrically neutral lithium, that is lithium in its natural state, if it has three protons, it's also going to have three electrons. So it's electrically neutral. Now, two of those electrons will go in the first orbital, and then the first orbital is filled. So the third electron needs to go into the second orbital. So the second orbital of lithium has exactly one electron. The core electrons are the electrons inside the valence orbital. The core electrons are said to screen or shield the valence electron 
from the pull of the protons in the nucleus. So those are the core electrons. Core electrons are all electrons inside the valence orbital. These electrons screen the valence electron, or electrons if there's more than one, from the pull of the protons in the nucleus. So there's, the va there's one valence electron in lithium. The effective Z number, that's Z, and the way you read that is Z effective, Z E F F is Z effective, measures how much of the pull of the protons an electron feels. So in other words, there's three protons. But how much of those three protons, those are pulling on all the electrons, but that we're interested in that valence electron, how tightly it's held to the nucleus. So how much of those three protons does that outer electron, that valence electron, feel? issue is it's that the pull is being blocked by those two core electrons. You can see how they're in the way in between the valence electron and the protons in the nucleus. Now this is a simplification. Those electrons aren't just sitting there. They're buzzing all over the place. But generally speaking they form a cloud and that cloud of those two inner electrons, core electrons, are, are blocking the pull of the cloud that's being formed by the outer electron that's further away. So Z effective, it's a very simple formula. Z effective equals the Z number minus the number of core electrons. So for, for the valence electron of lithium, Z effective equals 3. That's the Z number. That's the number of protons. Minus 2, that's the number of core electrons, equals 1. So the Z effective for that outer electron, that valence electron, is 1. So although lithium has 3 protons, its valence electron feels the effective pull of only one proton. So again, think about that. There's three protons and they're pulling on that valence electron, but they're being blocked out by those two core electrons. And therefore, that valence electron really only feels as if there's one proton holding it in rather than three. What effect does that have? It means it's easier to pull that valence electron away from the lithium atom than it would be if it could feel the full effect of those three protons. It only feels one proton holding on to it, so it's going to be easier to pull that valence electron away from the lithium atom. So that's what effectively that valence electron feels, which you see right there, only one proton pulling on it. Okay, we're going to get into some terms that you, you're going to hear literally every day in this class, and you've really got to nail down what they mean. They're not hard, but you've got to be sure that when you hear them, you, you know, you get to where it's natural, you understand what they mean very quickly and don't have to think about it every time. So the first one of those is ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount of energy that is required to pull an electron away from its atom. So you can think of it two ways. It's the amount of energy that the protons have hold, uh, are exerting to hold on to that electron. And if you can overcome that amount of energy that the protons are using to hold on to that electron, then that would be, um, then you'd be able to pull that electron away. And that's the ionization energy. It's how much energy it takes to create an ion out of, in this case, a lithium atom. So the man represents uh, ionization energy. The ionization energy must have greater pull on the electron than the protons do. So if it does, then the electron will be able to fly away from the, the atom. Ionization energy is also called electron binding energy. That's a term we'll probably almost never use in this class. The technical difference is ionization energy applies to gases, whereas electron binding energy applies to metals. And we really don't deal with metals very much in this class as far as their properties. It's mainly gases and um, gases and solids. So um, um, that's that's it. So we, we're going to use the term ionization energy. So now we're going to look at the trends in ionization energy across the periodic table. Ionization energies increase as you go up a group and also as you go right. So if you go from left to right across the periodic table, they increase. So the highest ionization energies are those elements in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. So helium 
oxygen, fluorine, neon, argon, chlorine, up there in the upper right, those have the highest ionization energies. It's very difficult to pull an electron away from those elements. In fact, it basically never happens in chemistry. So upper right are the strong guys, super strong guys uh, in that they hold on to their electrons really, really well. By contrast, elements down on the lower left, so that would be Rb, rubidium, Sr, strontium, Cs, cesium, Ba, barium, uh, and so on, down there in the lower left, those have very low ionization energies. Those have the lowest. It's the easiest to pull uh, at least one electron away from those elements. Okay, And then in between, higher up and, fur and further to the right from the lower left, they'll be a little bit stronger and stronger and stronger until you get to the upper right-hand corner. So here's a kind of a perspective view of the ionization energies. It's not every single element on the periodic table, but it gets you a sense of the of the patterns of the trends. So ionization energy is greatest in the upper right hand corner of the periodic table uh, where helium is. So the highest ionization energies are up there where helium is. The lowest ionization energies are down in the lower left. So re just remember those general patterns. Again, you can see there's a few little exceptions maybe to, to that, but they generally flow in that, in, that, uh, in that direction, in that pattern. Okay, now we're going to understand why that is. Why are those patterns? Okay, and that's, this is important that you be able to give explanations on basic chemistry phenomena like this. So this is a really important slide, the next few. So ionization and energies are lowest when an electron is furthest away from the nucleus, has more orbitals. That one's kind of obvious, right? Because if you get the electron further away, it's not attracted as well, as closely to the nucleus, as tightly to the nucleus, to the protons, and it has a lot more core electrons inside of it that are blocking it, that are shielding or screening the pull of the nucleus to that electron. So it's easier to pull those electrons away when they're in outer orbitals further away from the nucleus. That one's kind of easy to understand. The nucleus has fewer protons. That one's a little easier to understand. That one's not hard to understand. If the nucleus has few protons, then it won't have as much positive charge pulling on the outside electrons, and therefore it will be easier to pull the outside electrons away. Okay? But there's, uh, but, so let's go ahead and kind of look at that. So here's lithium. And we're in the second row of the periodic table. So we're at lithium number three, going over to fluorine number nine. We're not going all the way to um, to um, neon uh, in the second row. We'll just do um, over to fluorine. So lithium has a lower ionization energy for its valence electron. It only has one. Then fluorine, because its valence electron is the same distance from the nucleus as fluorine's electrons, but it has only three protons to attract it, while fluorine has nine to attract its electrons. So let's look at that. Let's look at the structure of lithium and fluorine. Both of them have two core electrons. That is two electrons inside their valence orbital, which is the second orbital for both of them. And you look at fluorine over there on the right, and it has a lot of valence electrons. It has seven, whereas lithium only has one. But that doesn't matter as far as shielding or screening because valence electrons don't shield or screen each other simply because they're right next to each other. They're side by side. An electron next to another electron doesn't shield or screen it from the nucleus. Only electrons inside, in an inside orbital that can block the pull of the protons will shield, will shield it. So both of them have two core electrons in the first orbital that will shield its valence electron or electrons. But lithium only has three protons. It only has a z-effective number of three minus those two core electrons is one proton pulling, effectively pulling on that outside valence electron. We already did that calculation. Let's just quickly do in our heads the calculation for fluorine. It has nine protons, but it also has only two core electrons in the first orbital. Nine minus two is seven. So the, all of the valence electrons, those outer electrons in fluorine, feel the pull of seven protons, not just, not just one as lithium does. Therefore, it's harder to pull the electrons away from fluorine, the valence electrons away from fluorine, because they feel the pull of seven protons pulling them in, whereas lithium, lithium's one valence electron only feels the pull of one proton. 
So the more protons, as long as you have the same number of orbitals, the more protons, the tighter the electrons will be held. So as you go from left to right, the ionization energy increases. It becomes stronger. It becomes harder to pull the electrons away from the elements over to the right, such as oxygen and fluorine, than it is to pull them away from the ones on the left, such as lithium and beryllium. So lithium has a z-effective number of 1. Um, the fluorine has a z-effective of 7, as we just said. Therefore, fluorine's uh, electrons are going to feel a greater pull than lithium's, and therefore it's going to be harder to pull fluorine's away. It's going to be easier to pull lithium's away. Bromine has a lower ionization energy for its valence electrons than fluorine because it has more orbitals. So its valence electrons are farther away from the nucleus. So now we're comparing fluorine to bromine, which is directly below it. They're both halogens, and we're going to compare them. Well, you see bromine, look at its outer electrons. They're shielded from the um, nucleus by all those core electrons. Whereas, again, fluorine has very few. It only has one core uh, orbital one, and two core electrons. So, so they're not shielded as much. Um, but bromine's valence electrons are shielded quite a bit. Therefore, it's easier to pull bromine's electrons away from it, its valence electrons, because they're so far away from the nucleus. Therefore, fluorine has a higher ionization energy than bromine. That one's a little easier to visualize why that happens. Each electron in an atom has its own ionization energy, which by the way is abbreviated IE. These are called the first ionization energy for the first electron ionized, the second ionization energy for the second electron ionized, uh, and so forth. So the valence electron of lithium has the lowest ionization energy. It is the easiest to pull away because it is shielded from the nucleus and as we calculated earlier, it has a Z effective of one. It feels the pull of one proton. The first ionization energy of lithium is 520.2 kilojoules per mole. Uh, note the units kilojoules per mole are a measure of energy we will discuss later. You'll hear, you'll come across that, that unit quite a bit in class. So 520, keep that number in mind as the first ionization energy so you can compare it to the others. Each electron in an atom has its own ionization energy. These are called the first ionization energy for the first electron ionized, the second ionization energy for the second electron, and so forth. Again, oftentimes I'll repeat st statements in, in successive slides or in different slides to reinforce the definitions. Okay, the second electron of lithium has a much higher ionization energy. It is not shielded from the nucleus and feels the pull of three protons. So it doesn't matter which one you consider to be the, the next the next one or the second one, but either one of the both of those have a Z effective of three. They both feel the entire pull of those three protons. Because they're side by side with each other, they're not considered to shield each other. So there goes the second electron. And the second ionization energy of lithium is 7,298 kilojoules per mole. These numbers, by the way, you have a table in your um, reference sheet section that gives you these numbers. But notice that number is about 14 times greater than the first ionization energy, which was 520. So why is that? It's because that second electron had no shield. Um, ionization energy... Um, each electron in an atom has its own ionization energy. These are called the first ionization energy for the first electron ionized, the second ionization energy for the second electron, and so forth. Okay, so the last electron of lithium has the highest ionization energy. It's not the same as the last one. It is not shielded from the nucleus and feels the pull of three protons. That was true of the last one. But in addition, it does not feel repelled by the other first orbital electrons. So that last electron was repelled by this one. They're both negative charges, so even though they don't shield each other, they push each other away. So that made it a little easier for that last electron to get out. But this electron doesn't have any other electron trying to push it away, trying to push it out. So in addition, it does not feel repelled by the other first orbital electron, which has been removed.
So it's the effective is also 3, but it doesn't have another electron pushing it away. So it finally goes away. So the third ionization energy of lithium is 11,815. So you went from 520 to 7,200 to 11,800. So that's, those are the, um, how the ionization energies work in an atom. And um, we'll talk more about that and, and give you some problems at a later time, uh, or give you some problems to do, to do on that. Electronegativity is how much an atom wants to pull on an electron uh, toward it from an atom which, to which it is covalently bonded. Now that definition means nothing to you right now. It will soon. I'm just giving you the, the, the alternate definition. Electron affinity is how much an atom wants to pull an electron toward it from the outside atom. So just to summarize that, electronegativity deals with how much an atom pulls electrons towards it when it's in a chemical bond, which is called a covalent bond, which we'll learn about in the, ne in the next couple of lessons. Whereas electron affinity is how much an atom wants to pull an electron just from somewhere outside of it. It's not with an atom that it's bonded with already. That's electron affinity. Now, lest you be worried about confusing these two, here's the punchline. You will not understand the difference between these two definitions at this point because we haven't defined covalently bonded. But here's the key point. Just understand, we will use the term electronegativity for both of these definitions throughout the class. Many books do that. They just call the ability to attract an electron, whether it's from within a chemical bond or from outside atoms, it's just going to be called electronegativity. Okay, the term electron affinity is just not used a whole lot. So get used to just using the term electronegativity to mean both of those. So electronegativity is how much an atom wants to pull an electron toward it, either from an outside atom, that would be electron affinity actually, or from, uh, from an atom to which it is covalently bonded, and that would actually be electronegativity. But the point is we're going to call both of those definitions electronegativity. So this man represents electronegativity. Electronegativity wants to pull in an electron. So there goes the electron getting pulled in. Electronegativity is measured on a scale of 0 to 4 called the Pauling scale. Fluorine has the highest electronegativity at 4.0. So let's look at the periodic trends for electronegativity. Electronegativity increases as you go up a group and right in the periodic table. In other words, exactly the same as um, ionization energy. And it makes sense kind of why. Both of them have to do with how much the nucleus, the protons in the nucleus, want to pull in an electron. Okay? Ionization energy is how much they pull in one of its own electrons that it already owns. Electronegativity has to do with pulling in electrons from the outside or from another atom. But they both have to do with the pull of the nucleus on electrons. And for that reason, they have the same trend. The highest electronegativities are in the upper right. The lowest are in the lower left. So the same as ionization energy. Electronegativity is greatest in the upper right hand corner of the periodic table where fluorine is and it's lowest down in the lower left. So you notice that looks very much like the um, perspective that you just saw for ionization energy. There's one significant difference. The elements on the right side of the periodic tables are called the noble gases. The noble gases have no electronegativity. We will learn the reason for this later. Well, actually, pretty soon. So lowest electronegativity, highest. But you notice that furthest column to the right with F, C, L, B, R, I, and A, T. Those are the halogens. Those are not the noble gases. The noble gases are um, helium, neon, argon, krypton on down. You don't see them there. Why is that? We're going to talk about that. Noble gases are not shown because they have no electronegativity. So the reason is very simple. A noble gases already have a filled octet, a filled outer orbital. And as you're going to learn very soon, that's what all atoms aspire to, is to have a filled outer orbital. 
since noble gases already have a filled outer orbital, they have eight electrons, with the exception of helium, they have eight electrons in their outer orbital, then they're happy. That's a, they're in their happy place. That's where they want to be. And what that means is they have no interest in pulling in additional electrons. So noble gases have no electronegativity. They don't at all want to pull in electrons. So let's, let's examine the, the trends in electronegativity and why they uh, increase in the direction they do. So again, we're going to look at the second row, second period, from lithium over to fluorine. We're going to exempt the, ex, exempt the noble gases. And then we're going to go down to a few of the halogens from fluorine down to bromine. So electronegativities are highest when an atom has fewer orbitals, same as ionization energy, and the nucleus has more protons, same as ionization energy. So let's look at lithium and, and fluorine from left to right there in the second row. Lithium has a lower electronegativity than fluorine because it has the same number of orbitals but fewer protons. So lithium does, doesn't pull in electrons as well as fluorine. In fact, the truth is lithium doesn't pull in electrons at all. It will never pull in an electron. So, so again, it's for the same reason as ionization energy is they have the same number of orbitals. They have um, the same number of, um, well, the same number of orbitals, uh, but lithium only has a Z effective of one whereas fluorine has a z-effective of 7. So fluorine does a much better job of pulling in not only its own electrons, but outside electrons. That's what electronegativity is about, is pulling in electrons from the outside, from outside of itself. So now going uh, from top to bottom, from fluorine down to bromine on the right, uh, in that right hand, that uh, halogen column, bromine has a lower electronegativity than fluorine because bromine has more orbitals and more core electrons. The electrons outside of the atom are screened more from the nucleus, so the atom can't pull in electrons as well. So that one really kind of is simple to understand. Bromine already has so many electrons there blocking the positive charge from reaching outside of, from out, to, to outside of the atom to grab an outside electron that it um, basically says, I can't do it. Okay. All right. Atomic radius. So think of a radius of a circle. It's the distance from the center of the circle to the outside of the circle. So atomic radius is kind of the same thing. Atomic radius is defined as half the distance between the nuclei of two bonded atoms of the same type. It is roughly the distance from the nucleus of an atom to its valence electrons. So if you take that distance between those two nuclei right there, and you cut it in half, then what you get is a distance essentially from one of the nuclei to its outside electrons, to its valence electrons. So it's kind of like a circle. It's from the center to the outermost orbital. All right, and that would be the definition of atomic radius. Atomic radius is important because some chemical properties depend on whether an atom can fit into some small spaces. So sometimes the size of the atom does make it, it's not just the chemistry of it, the size of it makes a difference whether it can actually go get where it needs to go to, do a, to perform a chemical reaction. So let's look at the trends in atomic radius. Atomic radius decreases as you go up a group and, and right in a period. So this is different than ionization energy and electronegativity. It decreases from left to right and it decreases going up. What that means is the smallest atomic radi radii, that's the plural of radius, the, the smallest atomic radii are in the upper right-hand corner, and the largest are in the lower left-hand corner. So this is one that's a little tricky, and you should be able to explain this. And when test time comes for this particular lesson, I will definitely ask this one. Atomic radius are highest when an atom has more orbitals. Well, that makes sense. As you add orbitals, they get further and further and further away, and the atomic radius gets greater. That's an easy one to understand. Here's the tricky one. The nucleus has fewer protons. The radius gets greater. So lithium has a larger atomic radius than fluorine. Now let's stop for a minute. Lithium, the typical lithium atom, has three protons, 
four neutrons and three electrons. That's a total of 10 particles. We, want just, we just generically would call those things particles. Fluorine has nine protons, 10 neutrons, and nine electrons. That's a total of 28 particles. So lithium has 10 particles, fluorine has 28 particles. So your common sense would tell you, well, fluorine's got to be a much bigger atom. It has all those particles to it. And yet it's tinier, and it's in fact much tinier than lithium. So that's what's called counterintuitive. It goes against what you think should be. So let's now, but once you learn the explanation, you, it should make sense to you why that is. So lithium has a larger atomic radius than fluorine because it has the same number of orbitals and, but fewer protons. So lithium doesn't pull electrons as well as fluorine. So it's exactly the same explanation as it was for ionization energy or electronegativity. Fluorine has a lot better pull on its outside electrons and then it therefore it pulls them in tighter. Not only the first orbital but the second orbital as well. They get pulled in very tightly because it has that Z number effective of seven for its second um, its valence orbital electrons. Fluorine has the Z number of one, only one for its valence electrons. So it doesn't pull it in as hard. So it doesn't pull its electrons in as tightly. Whereas fluorine, even though it has a lot more electrons, it pulls them all in much, much tighter. And so that's why as you go from left to right across the periodic table and you add more and more protons, neutrons, and electrons to each atom, in spite of that, the atoms get smaller and smaller and smaller because the protons, the increased number of protons, is pulling in the electrons tightly. So I hope that makes sense because that's the one that maybe is the trickiest to understand. Okay, fluorine in the upper right has the smallest radius. Now we look at bromine. Bromine has a larger atomic radius than fluorine because it has four orbitals compared to the only two for fluorine. Well, that one's easy to understand. You keep adding orbitals, you keep getting out further and further. You see those concentric circles getting farther and farther away from the center. So bromine is, of course, a much larger atom and has a much uh, larger atomic radius. So that one's easier to understand. Yeah, now you may say, well, wait, what about protons? It has way more protons. It has 35 compared to only 9 for fluorine. But that's offset by uh, by all the shielding that's done. And just simply the fact that the orbitals physically have to get farther and farther and farther away. Even if you feel that they're pulled in more, they're not going to be pulled in that much. They, you just you keep adding a third, a fourth orbital, and they're going to be farther away from the nucleus. And here's actually a diagram of atomic radiuses. It gives you relative sizes. So second period elements show that lithium is much larger. So look at lithium there, number three, that kind of um, uh, maroon colored um, atom. And then go way over to the right, and there's fluorine. And then even to the right of that is neon. Look how tiny fluorine is and neon compared to, lith to lithium. Even though they have a lot more protons, neutrons, and electrons, they're much, much, and not just a little bit, but much smaller than lithium. So you can see how the trends in the atomic radii, um, what they look like, you know, visually. So there, up there, you see lithium, and I actually circled neon, not fluorine, but you can see neon way over there on the right. So do, so do, Due to this fact, so second period elements such as lithium so much are, are is much larger than neon. This is due to the fact that both lithium and neon have two orbitals. However, neon has 10 protons pulling on its second orbital, while lithium has only three protons pulling on its second orbital. As we move to the upper right hand side, so identify that, the upper side and over to the right, of the periodic table, ionization energy and electronegativity increase while atomic radius decreases. Why? So this is just a summary question of what you just learned. So ionization energy, electronegativity increase going to the right, atomic radius decreases. So be sure you can explain those three. We're going to do that here in a minute anyway. And as you go up, ionization energy increases, electronegativity increases, and atomic radius decreases. So memorize, be sure you have those trends memorized. OK, 
Okay, so let's go through the explanation. As you go across a period row, that is from left to right, more protons are added to the nucleus with each element and the electrons are pulled in with greater force. This means that atomic radius will become smaller. The energy required to pull an electron out, that's ionization energy, becomes greater. And the ability to pull an electron in, electronegativity, also becomes greater. That's because of the increase in the number of protons as you go from left to right in each of those elements. Now the explanation going, um, going up or down. As we go down the periodic table, more orbitals are added. This makes the atomic radius larger. That one's kind of obvious. And the outer electrons are farther from the nucleus. The increased distance makes the ionization energy and electronegativity less. As those electrons get farther and farther from the nucleus, they're not pulled in as well, and therefore it's easier to pull them away. That's a lower ionization energy, and it's difficult for that atom with so many orbitals to be able to pull in outside electrons. So that's low electron. So each column of dots is a period or row on the periodic table. The yellow dots represent the second row with the top dot being lithium and the bottom dot being neon. The radius decreases across the period for reasons discussed earlier. The radius increases with each new row because an, or an, or an orbital is added. The blue, brown, and green columns have 18 dots because there are 18 elements in these rows. If you look at your periodic table, those would be the transition metals. So let's look at this. Um, ignore the first dot there. That's, that's hydrogen and helium in some combination. They only show one dot. There should be two. But let's go ahead to the second row. That would be the yellow dots. So lithium is the one at the top. It's just below the 180 number there. So that's its um, atomic radius. It's very large because we said on the, uh, it has very few protons pulling in on the electrons it has. It doesn't have very many electrons, but it, they're not being pulled in very hard. As you go down one dot, one yellow dot, then you're at beryllium, okay? And then you can continue on down all the way to uh, neon at the bottom, right where that second row arrow is pointing. So you can see that the radii get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go from left to right. Then as you add another orbital, you go down to the next row on the periodic table, you add an orbital, all of a sudden the radius jumps up again because now you have a third orbital in there. That's going to be much bigger than having just two orbitals. And so the one at the top is sodium, that's Na, and you continue across the third row down to um, the last element, which is argon there, which where, where it says third row. And that process continues. Again, the blue, purple, and green have a lot more dots because you also have the transition metals in there to, to take it. There's 10 in each row that has transition metals, there are 10 transition metals to add. So you don't just have eight elements, you have 18. Okay, mass spectroscopy is a way of determining the mass of an isotope. It works on the principle that a lighter atom can turn faster than a heavier atom. So think about what the difference is between two isotopes. Let's say, let's say carbon. Carbon uh, has to have six protons, but isotopes means it has different numbers of neutrons. Most carbon atoms have six neutrons, so that would be six and six would be 12. That would be an atomic mass, that would be a mass number of 12. But some carbon have 13 neutrons, so that would be six, uh, excuse me, let me stop, stop. They have, have a mass number of 13. They have six protons and seven neutrons, that would be a mass number of 13. Some carbon atoms have eight neutrons. That would be a mass number of 14. Six protons plus eight neutrons is 14. So what's the difference between those atoms? Think about it. They don't, they all have the same electrical charge. Nothing's changed about that. Nothing changed about protons and electrons, but they have more neutrons, more or less. That means that some are heavier than the others. And so what mass spectroscopy can do is sort out which are the carbon 12s, which are the carbon 13s, and which are the carbon 14s. Because the difference between them is their weight. The more protons they have, the heavier they are. It doesn't change electrical charge, just changes weight. 
So we know that a heavy object can't turn a corner as fast as a lighter object, like a truck and a motorcycle. So therefore, let's, let's see how mass spectroscopy works. So it works on the principle that a lighter atom can turn faster than a heavier atom. Okay, so we look at that motorcycle and that truck. It takes the big heavy truck a longer time or a bigger radius in order to turn than the lighter motorcycle. So if a truck and a motorcycle turn a corner, the lighter motorcycle will turn quicker than the heavier truck. So lighter isotope atoms curve quicker than heavier ones. So here's an a, a illustration of a mass spectrometer, uh, spectroscopy um, device or spectrometer it's called. So mass spectroscopy is a way of determining the mass of an isotope. It works like this. Number one, the isotope atom is ionized so it has a charge. Why does it have to have a charge? Because if a magnet is going to move a particle, it has to be charged. Magnets can't move neutral particles. They have no magnetism or electrical charge to them. It's like a piece of wood. A piece of wood won't move in a magnet. It has no charge to it. You have to have something that's magnetically or electrically charged in order to move. Generally in this class we talk about electrical charges and we talk about using magnets to move those electrical charges. So protons and electrons are electrically charged um, subatomic particles. Neutrons are not electrically charged. So a magnet moves the isotope through the tube so it pushes it through that tube. So a, mag a magnetic field moves ionized isotope atoms through the tube. The isotope atom passes through a perpendicular magnet. That's that one that's going uh, up and down. Um, it, that causes the isotope to curve. This perpendicular magnet causes the isotope to curve. How much the isotope atom curves depend, determines its mass. A heavier isotope will take longer to curve. So a heavier one, you think about it, if it's going through that tube, um, it's going parallel to the ground and then all of a sudden it goes through that magnet, the heavier one won't be able to turn as fast. So it's going to hit more to the right. You see that detector down there on the bottom right of the device? That's where the heavier one's going to hit. It's more to the upper right on that one because it can't turn as fast. And on a, you see the graph over there, let's learn how to read that. Relative abundance just means how many, okay? in relation to how many you put in, how many did you get. It's like a percentage in a sense, okay? Relative abundance. Then down on the bottom axis you see M over Z. And that would be mass over Z number. It's how much mass it has for its charge. Okay, And so you see that for a heavier one it's going to have greater mass so it's going to be further to the right. The charge is going to be um, the same because all of these ions are the same. It's the same element but the mass is going to be greater on the heavier ones, the ones that have more neutrons. So that's going to appear farther to the right on the graph. They're heavier. The lighter isotope curves faster. So you can see it curves really fast and it ends up on the bottom of that detector, the bottom left of that detector. And on the graph over there you can see it appears furthest to the left. It appears like for example right about where that 92 is. That's where the lightest one would be because it was able to turn faster so that means it has less mass. So each of those lines are showing how much mass each of these have for charge. Since the charge is the same, it just means it tells you where the most abundant masses are. So you can see right about 98 is the most abundant isotope of that. The least abundant would be, it looks like right around 97, 97 or 94, either one of those. So you should learn how to interpret this graph, okay? They like to ask these problems, mass spectroscopy problems. Okay, so be sure you understand the concept. It's designed to determine the relative abundance of isotopes. Does an element have 80%? Does carbon have 60% carbon 12 and 20% carbon 13 and 10% carbon 14? And you know what are the relative percentages? What are the amounts or relative amounts, percentages of each isotope of an element? So it's used to measure isotopes, how many isotopes you have of a particular element. Okay, photoelectron spectroscopy. They like to ask about this on the AP exam. So what is it? 
Photoelectron spectroscopy, which we'll simply call PES, that's what it's known as, is a way to determine the ionization energy of an electron. The ionization energy is equal to the energy of a photon minus the energy required to make the electron travel a particular distance. So we'll get to an example that will explain what that, what that all means. A photon, understand what that is for right now. We're going to talk about it later in this course, but it's a standard packet of energy delivered by light. So it's like a lightning bolt hitting that electron. But the lightning bolt has a very specific amount, known amount of energy that it contains. So that's what a photon is. It's a packet of standard, of a standard amount of energy that's going to strike those electrons and give them extra energy. So ionization energy is also called binding energy. Sometimes when you read about PES, they'll refer to it as binding energy. It's the same thing as ionization energy. There's technical differences, but we're not going to get into it, and we're really not going to use the term binding energy. So the following formula gives the binding energy or ionization energy. So E ionization, that's ionization energy, equals E photon, that's the energy delivered by the photon, that standard amount of energy, minus E kinetic. That's the motion energy of that electron as it's, as it, as it's given enough energy to free itself from the atom. It's how much energy it has flying away from the atom. So we'll get into some number examples that'll make this uh, help this to make sense. So here's electron number one. We're, that's the valence electron in lithium. Again, we're using lithium as our sample atom, three protons, three electrons. And that we're gonna call the valence electron electron number one. Now we're gonna assume that a 20 joule photon strikes this electron, electron number one. So what happens then, it's measured, and you, there's devices to measure these things. You don't really have to understand how it's done, the measurement sometimes, but there's a way to measure the energy of that uh, electron coming away from that atom. And it has 15 joules of kinetic energy that's required to make the electron number one travel that far, as far as that arrow shows. If 20 joules, if a 20, if the 20 joule photon caused electron number one to travel a distance that required 15 joules of energy, so there it goes, it flies out there, then there was 20 joules minus the 15 that it had coming out, which equals 5 joules of energy holding the electron to the atom. So let's break that down. That electron is in its orbital. It's comfy right there. It's hit with 20 joules. It then flies out and it's measured that it has 15 joules coming out. You don't have to worry about how they measure that, just they do. Okay, so it went in, 20 went into it, but it only had 15 joules of energy coming out. What happened to the other five joules? Where, where did they go? Well, that was the energy that was holding that electron to, the, to that atom that those protons were using to hold that electron in was that five joules. So you had to overcome those five joules just to break the electron away from the atom. The first five joules were spent just getting the electron to break away from the atom. Then the other 15 of the 20 caused it to fly away a certain distance. And that distance was how they determined it was 15 joules. They knew, you know, they knew that. Okay, so that's uh, that's the ionization energy. It's the five joules that was holding that electron to the atom. So five joules is the ionization or binding energy. Now let's write that out the way you would explain that, say on an AP exam. 20 joules of energy was absorbed by the valence electron, which then had enough energy to escape from the atom and fly a distance that required 15 joules of energy. This means that the that five joules of energy was needed to escape the atom. This is the ionization energy. So one more time, 20 joules hits the electron. Five of it is used just to pry the electron away from the atom. That leaves you with 15 and those 15 joules go into ca causing the electron to fly a certain distance away. So the difference between the energy that went into the electron and the energy that it was measured that the electron had coming out that difference was the amount that was holding the electron in initially. That's the ionization energy. 
So that's what PES is used to measure, is ionization energy. Okay, let's look at one of the remaining electrons now. So let's assume another 20 joule photon strikes uh, the, uh, one of the other electrons. Let's say it's electron number two. So it gets hit with 20 joules. And it flies out a distance that would require eight joules of kinetic energy to make that electron number two travel that far. So there was 20 joules in and eight joules out. So what happened to the other 12 joules, 20 minus eight? That had to be the energy that was holding the electron into the atom. Notice it's a much higher number than the first ionization energy. This is the second ionization energy. Okay, so it takes more energy to get that electron out because it's closer to the nucleus. There's no shielding electrons between it and the nucleus. And so it takes more, it's held in with, with a stronger energy. So 12 joules is the ionization or binding energy. And again, you would write that out as a complete paragraph the way it was done on the previous slide. So that is the end of a very long and challenging lesson. Okay, And um, again, we move through these quickly. Watch this once or twice. These are the nights where you will have 90, 90 minutes of, of homework uh, just to do the lesson. Um, on nights where you don't have 90 minutes to do the lesson, it doesn't take that long, um, then what you want to use the rest of the 90 minutes is to review older lessons. You're good. The more you can review, the more this subject becomes natural to you. It's not something you have to struggle with and think about every detail, but it becomes a natural part of you and your vocabulary and just how your mind works. All right, so that takes care of it. We'll see you in the next lesson.